Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, a zero-day exploit is affecting Windows boxes all over the web, and you won't believe how it's getting there. A weaponized PowerPoint presentation. I'm not even kidding. The details are fascinating. Plus, we'll tell you about why old ATMs are much bigger of a target than you might expect, but it's not because they're running Windows XP. And then it's a great big batch of your questions, our answers, and much, much more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Hi, everyone, and welcome to TechSnap. This is episode 185 of Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. We stream this episode live on October 23rd, 2014. This episode is brought to you by our three fine sponsors, DigitalOcean, Ting, and iX Systems. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this here show goes on. Our live stream, why, that's powered by the incredible Scale Engine over at ScaleEngine.com. You've got to go check them out. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, the admin, the tech, and the teacher, Mr. Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris, everybody. Thanks for watching. Hey, Alan. 185 episodes in a row. In a row. In a row. And that's... Kind of ridiculous. Kind of, kind of amazing. There was one or two close calls, but all, really. all in all. No. No, now we've got it down. Both of us, we're about to, we're about to leave. We're going we're gonna to go out of town. TechSnap show continues on. You'd never even know. You'd never even yeah. know. Pros. That's what I guess. I'm just feel like bragging at the top of the show today. I don't know what my problem is. I'm just well, excited. It just, I think. Yeah, it just turned out that uh, Meet BSD structured their stuff, so the Dev Summit is the days after. So I'll get home on Wednesday, right, and be fine for Thursday. And I'm leaving uh, first thing in the morning after today. After I get off the air today, uh, I'm going home, and uh, I have to uh, watch the kids. So that way, my wife can get her nails done because obviously that's important before you go on a trip. I don't I don't really I don't know how. But then we're going, we're leaving. And it's going to be fun. So maybe some of you watching today will meet us out at Ohio Linux Fest and then uh, next week you'll meet Alan at Meet BSD. So and the TechSnap show will continue on in the meantime. So a lot has happened this week and mm -hmm. one of the stories that I've noticed a few times over and over again seems to be different iterations of XYZ happens and ATM is now spitting out cash with no record or anything like that. And it seems to be catching on more and more. And uh, we have an article here from Brian Krebs where he kind of digs into this. Can you set it up? Well, yeah. What well, so he's, he's talked, uh, you know, he's covered this before. And we saw that once was it, uh, I think it was F-Secure or somebody actually was showing, we showed a video from it the other week too. Um, and so on. Uh, but in this time he managed to get an interview with somebody that works at one of these ATM companies and uh, get their perspective on it. Uh, so first he describes the growing trend of ATM jackpotting, mm. right? So before kind of six months ago or so, uh, the most common attack against an ATM was skimming, right? And Krebs was always interested in this. He, he found the little devices they use in Genius, right? And they got right. smaller and smaller. Like he talked about one we, we featured like a month or two ago and it was like razor thin and it just kind of slid in there. You wouldn't even notice it. Um, and so those scan your card, uh, read the medic, magnetic strip on your card as you put it in the machine and usually have an overlay on the button somehow so that they can tell what your PIN code is. And once they have the stripe from your card and your PIN code, they can program that on a blank card and go to an ATM and empty your account. Right. Uh, and, you know, that was working for them. The problem with that is that it only works if the cards you steal uh, are attached to accounts that have money in them. <laughs> okay, that <laughs> well, makes sense. A lot of people don't have that much money. Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> The new trend know how they is feel. install malware on the computer that's inside the ATM, uh, and that allows the attackers to just make the ATM spit out all of the money. There you go. Uh, it doesn't require some compromised account that has a large balance uh, to offset it. Uh, and the fraud is harder to detect because the money doesn't go missing from somebody's bank account who's going to complain about it, or the banks don't see the transactions. Right? If the bank all of a sudden sees that this one ATM, you know, or money is disappearing from a lot of accounts or something, all going to the same ATM, they mm -hmm. might look into it. But if the ATM is spitting out money and not recording it, then the bank doesn't know until all of a sudden the ATM's empty when it shouldn't be. Right. Yeah, wait, wait, what happened here? Can you go out there? Hey, Chris, go out there and check this ATM. We're getting an error report back that it's low on funds. Can you go out there and check that? And then I get out there, yeah. and I'm the, I'm the schmo that has to say, hey, this thing's empty. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, most times they're smart enough to leave some money in it so it doesn't trigger that alarm and so on. Uh, so then uh, 
he's got a quote here. Last month, media outlets in Malaysia reported that an organized crime gang had stolen the equivalent of about a million U.S. dollars with the help of malware they installed on 18 different ATMs across the country. Uh, several stories about the Malaysian attack mentioned the ATMs involved were all made by the ATM company NCR, which is a really big ATM company. Right. And so Krebs managed to get an interview uh, with, uh, where does his name go here? Uh, Owen Wilde, who's NCR's Global Marketing Director for Security Compliance Solutions. Okay. All right, I'll take which it. Which is kind of an awesome title, I suppose. <laughs> Owen Wilde, Global Marketing Director, Security Compliance Solutions. Yeah, it's like those two things. Don't, it's like Marketing Director and Security Compliance Solutions. doesn't seem... But anyway. Yeah. Uh, and he said that more than half of the ATM and... Uh, install base, uh, half the ATMs that are out there that come from this company are a model that they stopped making seven years ago. Oh, geez. And so, you know, does that mean that all those are running Windows XP or whatever? Uh, and so Brian Krebs asked him about that. And he says, uh, most of these attacks involve physically assaulting the ATM, removing the top or the front casing to get access to, this, to the PC that's inside and then infecting it via a CD-ROM or a USB stick or something. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, and then the quote from the marketing guy is, what we're finding in these types of attacks are occurring on standalone unattended types of units uh, that are much easier to access the top of the box than you would find in your wall-mounted or attended models. Sure. Right? So they're not attacking the ones that are built into the wall at the bank. They're attacking the little ones that are completely freestanding and maybe nailed down, but that's it. Uh, that are, you know, in little stores or in dark alleys and so on, not the ones that are built into the wall that are hard to, to attack. Because, A, if it's in a busy spot, people are going to notice somebody going up there and, like, cutting a big hole in the front yeah. of the ATM. Well, you're more like, yeah, you're more likely to get caught. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then if these, a lot of these ones are probably like the ones you mentioned before, maybe the ones that are at the Quickie Mart store around the corner or something like that. Right. Uh, but even one in a store, there's probably a salesperson in the store who would notice somebody screwing with it so these are the ones that are just you know out in the middle of nowhere or something and so they're specifically targeting ones where they can have access to it for a while with no one knowing what's up mm -hmm. uh, so then Brian Krebs is like you know we've also heard a lot about Windows XP being a big part of the problem here right uh, and he asked the guy and the guy's response about XP was right now it's not a major factor it is certainly something that has to be uh, considered by the ATM operators in making their migration move to newer systems. Microsoft discontinued updates and security patches uh, on Windows XP with very expensive exceptions. So this automatically makes me assume that NCR isn't providing the Windows license to the customers or something. Right? Like uh, NCR isn't going to pay the big, the, was it like $2 million mm -hmm. to Microsoft to get extended uh, support? It's huge, for yeah. This. Because they've discontinued that model seven years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, each individual store or whatever that owns one of these ATMs would have to buy the license from Microsoft, and that's not going to happen. Mm, no. Not if, if that cost goes to not the manufacturer but the end user, which I guess it yeah. probably would, wouldn't it? Yeah. It does in uh, PCs. Where it becomes an issue for ATM operators is in maintaining their payment card industry uh, data security standard, or PCI DSS, right? Uh Compliance uh, requires that the ATM operator be running an operating system that receives ongoing security updates. Mm. So, you know, your machine won't meet the PCI compliance if it's running XP and you haven't paid for the updates. Uh, so while many ATM operators clearly have compliance issues because they're not have running XP without the updates, at, at this point we're not seeing the operating system really come into play, right? Because honestly, if they're walking up to the machine, breaking into the ATM and have physical access to yeah, the machine, yeah. it doesn't really matter which version of Windows you're running. They can install malware. Mm -hmm. It might be slightly easier to make a rootkit for Windows XP with a known vulnerability. Yeah, there's probably but, more resources to do it. But really, it's if you're making malware that's going to run on the machine and you have physical access to it, it's just as easy to install that malware on Windows 7 than Windows XP. It's not like they're trying to come in through the network or something, right? They've actually isolated these on the network properly, right? Nobody's remotely hacking these ATMs. They're walking up to it, punching a hole in the plastic, and getting at the USB ports or something. Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, it, it, I guess it's like after all other things have failed, then you get to XP and it's easy, but you have to go through physically entering the machine. Could right. be a, it could be a yeah. Linux machine at that point. Yeah, exactly. It, it, the operating system isn't really the cause of the problems in these cases. It's the fact that they're using standard off-the-shelf PCs 
and not hardening them. Right. Now, the company goes on to say that, you know, for years now they've recommended that the customers go into those PCs and disable booting off CD-ROMs and USBs and stuff. But it seems like, well, obviously they haven't shipped a new unit of this type in seven years, so they, it's not like they um, thought to change that before they, when they were still shipping them or whatever, right? They've only been saying that since when this attack became a thing. Uh, right. But it seems like how many people that own an ATM are really going to tear it apart, uh, go in there and change the BIOS settings on the computer inside? Right, so say the company publishing guidelines telling you how to secure it, and when nobody's going to do that, and then they're like, well, sorry, you didn't follow our guidelines isn't really yeah. a solution. But then again, it's, it's like, well, when you buy an ATM, do you get a support contract with it or something where they're actually going mm -hmm. to do something to fix it? Or do you just say, well, you own an ATM now, uh, have fun. <laughs> no, I think in almost all cases there's a support contract, right? Right, and if there is, it's like, well, don't you guys have to send me a tech to come and change the BIOS for me then? You would think so. But yeah. if the BIOS is that easy to change, then what's stopping the attacker from doing that? Just going back into the BIOS and turning it back on. Exactly. You're going to put a password on the BIOS? Well, depending how much access you have to the machine, pull the battery for five seconds and put it back and the BIOS is reset and the password's gone. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that doesn't really help anything either. No, and like you mentioned, I think it was last week, in some of these, they're able to buy certain models right off of eBay and experiment with them for hours. They could find all kinds of different ways to get access to them. Right, and because even if you did, like you mentioned the other week, the group policy stuff, that can help, but in the yeah. one case, they were booting off the CD. Mm -hmm. So they're actually running a live OS off the CD drive so, in the ATM. What's the And fix? so they're bypassing whatever the ATM was. Well, and then they also... Uh, the next quote kind of addresses your question. Uh, most of these attacks come down to two different types of jackpotting the ATM. Jackpotting meaning making it spit out money for free. Right? right it looks right. like a, it looks like a, a casino slot machine when it's just like here, ding, have ding, all ding, my ding, money. Ding, ding. Yeah. <laughs> um, the first is what we call black box attacks, where some form of electronic device is hooked up to the ATM, uh, basically bypassing the infrastructure. Basically. It, you know, the ATM is two parts. There's the computer that runs the screen and makes the decisions, and then there's the actual ATM, which is the part that counts out and dispenses the machinery. Bills. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, by connecting a little um, electronic device to the ATM part, you could just simulate the signals from the computer saying, hey, spit out all the 20s. <laughs> and so uh, in the one type of black, uh, black boxing, they wouldn't, actually bother with malware they would just hook up a device that would cause the motor to start running and spitting out bills uh those were really popular back in uh started in like 2012 and then kind of went quiet for a while but came active again in 2013 uh and then obviously we have the malware based ones where they actually install malware and and do it that way <clears throat> so i think part of the real solution is to uh basically make the the machines more vandal proof hmm. right like we've seen the the original security cameras were very easy to just break or or scratch up the lens mm. or whatever mm -hmm. and then they were useless and so then they started making vandal proof atm or um security cameras that would resist people trying to scratch them or or break them or whatever right it's like if if a cord is hanging out of your security camera that someone can just yank out of it then it's not a very good security camera yeah, and I, what about? Uh, I mean, I realize it would uh, it would cause problems for serviceability, but what about uh, custom built systems that maybe don't have exposed USB ports? Right, it's really not that hard to uh, not have USB ports on these machines. I don't think. Yeah, and uh, it might. I mean, and and anything you do, I, anything you do would help. Maybe make them ARM based systems. I don't know. Maybe that would help a little bit. Maybe make maybe them not so much. I, I think just physically, you know harder anything like, that makes it a little bit harder any little encase the computer part in some metal instead of some yeah, plastic yeah <laughs> put them all That's raspberry right. pies destroy the usb ports xbmc for the interface be the best looking atm you've ever used yeah, but doing arm is just obfuscation it doesn't make it any more no secure. i know i know i well it's just because i i think about all these little like uh, downloads off the web that are all for x86 windows xp boxes but it really is just a small thing. It's because it's really more about getting physical access. 
Exactly. It, it doesn't matter what operating yeah. system you have. I if know. the attacker has physical access, they can get around almost any security. Right. Uh, for true, for for really for all for all types of systems, not just ATMs. <laughs> true for exactly. servers. True for a lot of things. Exactly. That's why you know you used to see servers with those little locks on the drive cages. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Although that wasn't you know those aren't exactly secure either, but. The idea was that it will keep someone who yeah. shouldn't from pulling a drive out of the damn My thing. Hulk strength, Alan. I can just go in there and I have what I have super strength apparently because I just rip those things out like Hulk. It's yeah, yeah. Uh, right. All right, but you know that's why data centers have security so that people can't just walk in and walk out with data. Mm-hmm. It's an important part. Well, why don't I mention our first sponsor? Speaking of data centers, and that's DigitalOcean. Head over to DigitalOcean.com right now and grab our promo code so that way you can get a ten dollar credit. It's Snap October. One word. Snap October. Systems Network Administration Podcast October. Snap October. So what is Digital Ocean? Oh, what a great question. Uh, they might just be the solution to a problem you've had. Uh, Digital Ocean is a simple cloud hosting provider that's dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up a cloud server. You can get going in no time. Most folks, 55 seconds probably, to get their first server spun up and pricing plans start at only $5 a month. So in 55 seconds, you can get 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. And DigitalOcean has awesome data centers. I've, I think I've mentioned on the show, I know you guys like your data center porn. Uh, the DigitalOcean Instagram account has some great di- di- uh, DigitalOcean data center pictures in there. It, it was. I'm just saying, I like those pictures. If I could double like, I would be double liking those pictures. Because they've got data centers in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, London. They support multiple features in all of those data centers, like private networking, which doesn't count towards your bandwidth total. So if you want to have a front-end Nginx box that's connecting back to a bunch of back-end Apache or whatever, it's proxying connections. You could do that. You want to have a front-end web server with a back-end database, you can do that. You want to have a front-end server, you can do it. I'm just saying, private network doesn't go against your transfer. That's awesome, right? And DigitalOcean's dashboard, that's really the secret sauce. They've managed to take all of this technology. They made the early investment in SSDs. They've got the best data centers with Tier 1 bandwidth, but then they bring it all together with their simple and intuitive control panel, which power users can replicate on a larger scale with DigitalOcean's straightforward API. There's lots of neat apps that are already out there to take advantage of that, to manage your DigitalOcean droplets. You have a puppet system to manage your boxes, DigitalOcean will roll with that. That API is super handy. Mm -hmm. And right now, if you go over to DigitalOcean's community section at the top of their page and look at the tutorial section, you'll see that they have a Write a Tutorial button. DigitalOcean is paying up to $200 for technical tutorials. They're looking for potential authors to come over there and start out. They've got editors that will work with you, and you can get up to $200 for writing a tutorial for DigitalOcean because they're trying to get their documentation really to be the best. I think it is now. It's the best in the business now, and it's because they're willing to pay for it, and I think that really shows. DigitalOcean.com. Go try out a droplet. Grab the $5 rig, and with our $10 promo, you can try it out two months for absolutely free. That's Snap October. Fire up a DigitalOcean droplet. Try it out for two months. Go try something like GitLab, WordPress, BitTorrent Sync, Pulse, OwnCloud, all kinds of stuff. DigitalOcean.com, Snap October when you check out. And a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the TechSnap program. Okay, Alan, I've heard the term the Sandworm team thrown around a little bit. Well, when I first heard it, it, it was just sandworm with the team part, and then everybody thought like, it was a worm. But it's not a, but it's not a worm. No. So why is it called sandworm? It's, it's sandworm team. So what is it? Uh, and I guess it was the kind of the connotation of, is more like the graboids or whatever. The team is like that. Yeah, anyway, yeah. Ah, uh, so I have it's not a worm, but still a big deal. Okay, That's my little thing, but. So uh, Microsoft announced the discovery of a zero-day vulnerability affecting all supported versions of Windows, including Windows Server 2008 and 2012. Uh, reports are also coming in that these, uh, this specific vulnerability has been exploited and used to attack uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, and several oh, European yes. industries and sectors, including the Ukrainian government. Uh, this particular vulnerability is alleged uh, to have been in use since August of 2013, making it more than a year old. Uh, and apparently mostly used through weaponized PowerPoint documents. Yeah, <laughs> Weaponized PowerPoint? Yes, I've only ever seen PowerPoint used as a weapon to put people to sleep. Right. But, uh, 
It could be an Excel um, file with a flash object. You never know. Uh, so this uh, vulnerability exploits a flaw in the Microsoft OLD functionality, which is the one that lets you embed a flash object into an Excel document. Uh, but instead, in this ca in the one case they're talking about here, they embedded an INF file, which could then download and launch malware. Uh, so this allowed a PowerPoint or other Office document to have an embedded file uh, and to embed an external untrusted resource. Uh, so this caused remote code execution, allowing the attacker to run whatever code they embed into the um, the PowerPoint, PowerPoint file. file? Whatever, oh my gosh. Uh, whatever, instead of, to avoid making the PowerPoint file bigger or to have this file attached where it might be detected by a virus scanner, um, it did... Um, had the INF file that would then go and get the virus from the internet and install it. Clever. Uh, and so in that case, it would, whatever user PowerPoint is running as, the virus right, runs at. Right, yeah. Uh, and many users still have administrative rights, especially if it's a separate desktop. Maybe in a, in a uh, you know, Active Directory type environment, maybe they don't have that much access, but they have enough access to access all the documents, which is oftentimes what the attacker is after. So it doesn't really matter. They just that they want don't the data. Yeah. They want the data that person has access to. Yeah. And if the uh, malware has full control of that user, that might be good enough. Uh, or they can just spread around until they find an admin user and take over that machine and get access to everything from there. Uh, and then so iSight Partners, the company that uh, found the flaw, said uh, we were actively monitoring multiple intrusion teams with differing missions, targets, and attack capabilities. Uh, and that they say at least five distinct intrusion teams, and they're uh, saying they're all coming out of Russia. <clears throat> they say, uh, for example, we recently disclosed the activities of one of these teams, dubbed Czar Team, uh, surrounding the use of mobile malware. This team has previously launched campaigns targeting the United States and European intelligence communities, militaries, defense contractors, news organizations, NZOs, and multilateral organizations. It has also targeted jihadists and rebels in Chechnya. And that's another reason why they, they're thinking these are kind of more state-style uh, Russian attackers is because what they're going after isn't money, right? It's, it's actually going after... Uh, the Ukrainian government, Western or, European or, government organizations, or energy in, sector firms. Or the rebels in Chechnya. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, there's more intelligence gathering, right? They want documents and information rather than money or control or whatever. Uh, then separately, Trend Micro found the same flaw being used against uh, SCADA systems. They say uh, these attacks target Microsoft Windows PCs running uh, GE's intelligent platform Simplicity HMI solution. <laughs> uh, and those machines are being targeted with a spear phishing attack. Uh, and apparently... The way they word it in uh, Trend Micro, they're saying the Simplicity software opens the email. I'm not sure if that's how it actually works or if they just mean that if you open it in Simplicity. I'm not sure. But uh, either way, then you download the Black Energy malware kit, yeah. uh, which then takes over the machine. And then, you know, whatever industrial control systems are being managed by the Scott system. Managed right now by under this the Windows box. The attacker. This Windows box. This so box running some software from GE. Right. <laughs> and they can't even spell simplicity properly. They spelled it with a C. <laughs> wow. Uh, so, uh, so then I have links to the researcher's uh, post over at iSightPartners.com. Yeah. A technical analysis by HP Security Research. So the, uh, so more these, coverage from ZDNet and the official bulletin from Microsoft. The headlines I've been seeing Russian hackers target NATO in Ukraine is, is the same. It's all been related. Yes. It's all yes, related uh, to this Windows Zero Day. But basically, the eyesight says they've found at least five separate teams uh, working on different parts of the thing. Right? One of them is going after mobile phones. One of them seems to be going after SCADA systems. Another one maybe after desktops and documents and you know, so on. Hmm. When I hear these stories, I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but I... I wish we had a more solid way to prove who it was because it sounds political Wait. when I when when we well, when the countries get identified it always to me sounds political. Yes, uh, although in this case the evidence does actually point to it a little bit more than usual. Mm -hmm. Often it's always just China, blah, 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 blah. but right, you know, in yeah, this yeah, one, yeah. the specific targets it's like there's not many people that are interested in what the rebels in Chechnya are doing, except for the Russians. Right. 
well, obviously, I guess other intelligence agencies want to know what everybody's doing. That's too, kind of my th- thinking. Is they, it seems like all intelligence agencies want to know all the things all the time. So it could be right. any one of them. Exactly. Now, and, uh, sometimes again, you know, they find stuff in the code that kind of suggests one thing or another, but they don't. Use, uh, a lot of these reports don't actually come out and say what evidence they used to decide that it was Russian. Yeah, I do like that it has a like the chat room is observing Keller CW and the chat room is noticing the awesome sandworm logo. Yes. That is pretty good. Now, also, Microsoft didn't Microsoft release a statement saying they weren't sure yet if they were going to issue an out of band patch? I'm what? not sure. Um, the the HP article yeah. actually tears apart the fix and finds that the fix makes the attack harder, but right. someone might still be able to re exploit this by making a better attack. Yeah, it's like a workaround fix. It's one of those Microsoft fix it fixes. It's not like yeah. a fix fix. So basically, it, it adds an extra user prompt or something and does some other stuff, but um, basically, it's not it's good like, enough. It's if not the good thing enough. that we're embedding over OLE isn't executable, do these extra things. It's like, well, one of the attackers was already just using an INF file to avoid. Yeah. Being an executable. Right. So, right. Yeah. And it's and it affects all supported versions of Microsoft Windows right now. Yeah. So Well, I think technically it only affects Office. I guess OLE is system wide. O- yeah, OLE yeah. OLE has been the source of so many problems over the years. It's like why do we really need to be able to embed random files into our Office documents? Do you ever whenever that has ever if you if you've well, ever gotten a document, do you ever want that ever? Whatever, but maybe images, maybe, but there's better ways to do images. I, people try to embed like a giant video yeah. they made in Windows Movie Maker into a PowerPoint and it's just like, oh my God, what are you doing? It's no good. It is no good. It breaks frequently for end users. It doesn't produce consistent results. Microsoft should just kill it in Windows 10. Say the reason why we're calling it Windows 10 is because we killed OLE and to make that big of a change we had to call it version 10. Then you got your excuse right there. All right, Alan. Also, ActiveX. If that's not <clears throat> right. already dead, it should be dead. That w- could you, Microsoft, listen. If you, Satya, if, you lo- if you're watching, I'm sure you do. If you could just make those tweaks, the TechSnap show would really appreciate it. Okay, Alan. Well, before we go on, uh, let's thank Ting. Ting is mobile that makes sense. My mobile service provider now for, I'm going to be coming on two years soon. Not yet. Not yet. But you know what I love about Ting. I only pay for what I use. It's a flat $6 a month for the line. And then it's just my usage on top of that. Ting takes my minutes, my messages, my megabytes. They add them all up, and that's just what I pay. So I pay pay for the $6, easy, and then my usage. Well, guess what? I'm usually sitting in this studio or at home, and I'm on Wi-Fi all the time. So I use, like, Viber to make my calls or Hangouts, and my minutes are super, super low. So thanks to that, I have three phone lines. And I'm still paying like 40 something a month for three smartphones, an iPhone 5, an HTC One, and a Nexus 5, all smartphones, all with data, all with hotspot tethering, caller ID, picture messaging, all the features you'd expect for like 40 something a month. Plus, I own my phones outright. I'm not stuck in some sort of contract where there's an early termination fee. That feels awesome. And if I ever get stuck, I can call Ting and speak to an actual human at 1-855-TING-FTW when you call them between 8 a.m., or 8 p.m. They've also just recently updated their dashboard so it rocks even harder than before. They've got a great new line of devices as well and also worth a look when you visit techsnap.ting.com. Would you go there? Techsnap.ting.com. That'll give you a $25 discount off your first device. It lets them know too that you appreciate them supporting the TechSnap show. And if you got a Ting compatible device already, like you're a pro, if you're pro level and you're bringing like a Moto G or your own Ting device, They'll give you $25 of service. So f- go to techsnap.ting.com. Check them out. Try out that savings calculator. See how much you'd save by putting your actual usage into the savings calculator. It's kind of ridiculous. And then go to the yep. blog as well. And they've got a great post up right now, and I think this would probably work for any network. I don't think this is anything Ting specific, but I'm not sure. I haven't read it yet. But I love it. How to block unwanted callers. And they tell you how to do it natively using native applications in the app. Uh, on how to do it on Android and iOS. And they also talk about uh, a couple of Android apps, or one Android app, Mr. Number, that you can use. So this is a great post that I think would apply to anybody who wants to know how to block unwanted colors on Android and iOS. So go to techsnap.ting.com. Try out that savings calculator. See how much you'd actually save by switching to Ting, and then you'll see why I did it. Techsnap.ting.com. Techsnap.ting.com. Finally, mobile that makes sense with no contract, no early termination fee, and only paying for what you use. Plus, they have an early termination relief program. So if you're in a contract, they'll pay up to $75 per line. You have to get canceled. Techsnap.ting.com. 
dot com. You know, Alan, I'm bringing. Uh, I've I've been debating which uh, phone I would bring on my trip. Do you, Do you go through this at all? Do you ever have this problem? Like, I only really have the one phone. Yeah, I have the Firefox phone, but it doesn't have a SIM card in it, so right. it's not very much use. So uh, my Android L phone has started crashing on me a little bit in the last couple of days. So I'm not bringing the Android L phone. I don't think. But otherwise, I'm loving the Android L. Uh, speaking of Android, our first story, or I'm sorry, our third story, I can count, I promise, I can count. Our third story this today, today is actually about Android and delivering malicious apps to Android, isn't it? Yes. Tell me about it, sir. Uh, so this one is uh, some researchers presented their findings at Black Hat Europe, which was last week in Amsterdam. And basically what they found is a way to hide their malware in another application that looks legitimate. Uh, so basically, what they he, uh, one of the researchers wrote this tool uh, that basically allows you to encrypt uh, an APK file, which is kind of just a zip file with all the Android stuff. Like in the it. package file, yeah. Yeah, um, encrypt it, kind of almost with steganography into a JPEG or a PNG file. No way, really. You, so an you take AP- an existing picture and you basically encrypt the APK file and then hide it in a JPEG. So that when, even if someone's reverse engineering your app or, you know, kind of like manually checking your app to make sure it's not malicious, all they see is a JPEG or a PNG that actually is a picture and looks fine. This is but crazy. Then when your, uh, your, your dummy app that has this picture as one of its resources, like your company logo or something like right. you would see in every app. Right, sure. Um, it can then decrypt the APK out of the image and run it and run the malware. I love uh, their demo example here. This yes. is really mm-hmm. great. Uh, thus, the malicious app remains hidden from reverse engineering, antivirus programs, and the Google Bouncer. So this wrapper app can go up in the Google Play Store or something and uh, seem legitimate. Uh, in their testing, Android did not... Uh, in testing, Android did show a permission request when the wrapper file tried to install the malicious ABK, but the researchers say they can prevent that using the DEX class loader uh, to be able to reference the app without running it normally. Jeez. And so Android wouldn't pop up a pop-up saying, hey, do you want to allow this app to run? The really interesting one is uh, the researchers kind of got the idea from a malware they had seen in the past. Uh, this one was uh, Android slash GameX.A pound tr and what this one did is in its resources there was a file called logos.png but it wasn't a png it was just a zip file and so you know that might be detected fairly obviously uh but they somehow made it very clever if you open the zip file it would open and there were files in it and you could extract them and they were legitimate regular files and everything was fine however if you did uh, an xor which is uh not really encryption, it's just kind of shifting all the bits, uh, with a certain key on that zip file, it would be a different zip file that contained the malware payload. So they kind of hide the zip in plain sight as a zip that looks like it contains some files, but if you do an XOR of it with a certain key, it's now a different zip file that contains the malware. Hmm. That's pretty ingenious. Uh, and so that's where they got the idea from originally. Uh, and then they, it turns out that the way zip files work, the header that says this is a zip file and contains blah, doesn't have to be at the very, very start of the file. The header for a PNG file does, right? And most files are that way, right? The header that says this is a PNG file or this is a JPEG or whatever goes at the very front of the file. Uh, so they found that if they just used like the Linux cat utility, cat, some PNG file, some zip file, then if you do file on it, then it says this is a PNG. If you uh-huh. open it in a web browser, whatever, this is a PNG. Right. And it shows the picture. It looks like a PNG to me, boss. Yeah, but if you open it in the zip utility, like unzip, it will see the files that are in the zip and let you extract them. However, the Android zip thing is a little pickier, right? It doesn't accept quite such a you know, programs are always, uh, especially in open sources, be liberal what, with what you expect from other people, but, you know, make sure you follow the spec very closely when you're making something. Uh, but the Android version basically won't uh, accept zip files like that because they're, 
you know, technically probably not valid. It just happens that most implementations will open a zip file that's just catted onto the end of a PNG file. Uh, but be so what they ended up doing is basically make their APK, which is a zip file, then encrypt it and embed it in this, the PNG file. Hmm. Uh, and then the interesting thing is since then they've added to the file called angcrypt, uh, which allows you to take any existing PNG, JPEG, FLV, which is a flash video, or PDF file, and embed the APK into it. And there's a little Python script that I've linked to, and you can grab the code and play with it. And uh, I've also included their slides from the uh, Black Hat uh, and the paper they wrote uh, for their talk. Yeah, this is great stuff. And it looks like it's as current as of Android 4.4.2 at least. Yeah. Uh, it's quite interesting that they managed to, to do that. Yeah. Anakin Skywalker encrypted with AES in CBC mode. Yep. Key is angry. Or, or anger rather, equals dark uh, side. <laughs> so they took a picture of Vader, encrypted it, with AES, with that key and a, yeah. and a certain initialization vector, and the output is an image uh, of Anakin Skywalker. Mm -hmm. So they actually kind of uh, took advantage of, of messing with the input to get a certain output. Pretty respectable work here. Yeah. I, I, I got to imagine that's got to be a thrill to see a presentation like that. Mm hmm uh, And they say they did notify the Google security team as well. So Google has been notified and a I think a patch has been pushed upstream to ASOP, but who, again, every time we talk about one of these Android things, when it hits your device, yeah. so that's anybody's guess. There. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about this a little later in the show, mm. but just because somebody wrote a patch and made it available to everyone mm. doesn't mean that it actually got used. <laughs> that's the problem. That'll be an interesting <clears throat> one uh, a little bit later in the show in the roundup. Very good, Alan. Very good. Well, any other thoughts on that story? Uh, no, but the whole paper's there if you're more interested in this. Yes, uh, great slideshow. Quite interesting. Very good slideshow, which uh, explains if you had if you had any trouble following along, uh, there are good visuals in the slideshow, which explains a lot of it. Exactly. And then there's the PDF uh, from the actual paper, which has all the technical detail if you want to uh, learn more about how it actually works. Indeed. Indeed. Richard is, in fact, your sister's brother. All right, Alan, why don't we move on to IX Systems, ixsystems.com slash techsnap. Go there, won't you? ixsystems.com slash techsnap. Why IX Systems? For the same reason probably why Alan and I purchase our hardware from IX yep. Systems. We trust them. We trust them implicitly to know that they can meet our needs, that they're going to build the best box possible. They're going to burn and test that box for me, and I'm going to get a white glove experience end to end. From customer service, pre-purchase, all of that, IX Systems has it covered. And I know that the people that are helping engineer their products and solutions are some of the most experienced in the industry. In fact, some of them are creating the very technologies that we rely on. So talk about having experts. And, you know, that's why here at Jupiter Broadcasting, when we decided to have serious storage, we went with a FreeNAS Mini. And don't be fooled by the term Mini. There's nothing really all that Mini about FreeNAS except the size of the box. It's incredibly powerful, and they've got a brand new one with these server-grade Intel Atom processors. Yeah, I can't yep. believe I'm saying it either, but th such a thing actually exists now, and well, they rock. I know a lot of people's uh, always the complaint people had about by uh, taking some PC they had and turning that into a free NAS instead of buying a NAS at Best Buy or whatever was that, well, my old PC is going to use more power than this little embedded box. It's like, well, now IX sells this little box that only uses 17 watts for the processor. Yeah. Because it's Atom-based. And you've heard, you've heard about the reliability and rock-solid performance of FreeBSD and ZFS. So why not get a storage solution built by the people behind FreeNAS, right? You're starting to see the logic here. When you go with IX Systems, it's a different experience than any other hardware vendor you've ever bought from. These are people who don't just kind of know how to implement the technology, right? It goes so much further beyond that. They have connections with the hardware industry and partners with the hardware industry that go so much deeper than your average company. They have the people that are creating the software. They have the deep connections to the community. In fact, that's why Alan's going to meet BSD and where is that at, yep. Alan? 
Where are they that's holding at, that? At? They're actually hosting that at Western Digital's headquarters in San Jose, California. These are just, just down the street about. from where IX has their headquarters. When IX wants to party, they party with one of their hardware buddies. They got it. They got that situation dialed in. They really yes. do. Uh, Intel and Western Digital are both big sponsors of the conference. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. So check out ixsystems.com slash techsnap and go see why so many folks have chosen IX Systems for their solution. You can also grab that free white paper, The Ultimate Guide to Buying a New Server for Open Source, 11 Key traits that you should demand from your provider. That'll help grease the wheels if you're trying to make a decision about switching. There's some really good points in there. It's a really, really great white paper. ixsystems.com slash techsnap. And a big thank you to ixsystems for sponsoring the TechSnap program. You know, they're also sponsors of another Jupiter Broadcasting show. Those crazy guys over at BSD Now. The ones that just hit their 60th episode. Yep. Don't buy a router. (laughs) That's it. Oh, Alan. There you go. Episode 60. Uh, that's actually, uh, if you're interested, uh, that's an interview with uh, Olivier Collab. I forget his last name. Anyway, uh, he's the guy that actually founded FreeNAS and then gave it to IX Systems because he's actually a, a network guy, not a storage guy, and didn't know anything about storage. He just wanted to store some files, so he wrote uh, FreeNAS. Uh, and, you know, IX are like storage experts. So he's like, yeah, you guys take that. I'm going to go start the BSD router project and design an appliance to replace a Cisco. So it's actually not a competitor to PFSense. PFSense is replace that little Linksys or Netgear or whatever you have at your house, whereas the BSD router project is replace that big $200,000 Cisco you have at work. Hmm. You can go find out more about that, episode 60 yeah. of BSD. Now, I'll give a quick plug to Unfilter. 119 Weapons of Mass Encryption. We played uh, a few uh, unbelievable clips by the FBI director who's going to be petitioning Congress to force Google and Apple to modify Android and iOS to make it easier for them to decrypt the files that they've now announced they'll be encrypting in iOS 8 and Android L. So there's some fascinating audio that we played in Unfilter 119 Weapons of Mass Encryption. So if you're interested about that, check that out. Two great episodes, BSD Now 60 and Unfilter 119. But Alan, you know what? The news is all done, so that means it's time for the TechSnap Feedback. Thanks for sending your emails to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or popping that contact link at the top of the Jupiter Broadcasting website, or even better, starting a thread in our subreddit over at techsnap.reddit.com. And our first bit of feedback is actually a follow-up from the folks at DuckDuckGo. They wrote in last week to tell us about DuckDuckHack, duckduckhack.com, and they said they've gotten some great responses, and I wanted to mention it again. So are you familiar with duckduckhack.com? That's DuckDuckGo's open source instant answer platform and any developer can create an instant answer which is then showcased in DuckDuckGo's search results. And I last week showed you a couple of them and I found a couple of more really cool ones to kind of show you the idea of how anyone out there that has a subject they're passionate about and an expert on can go over to DuckDuckHack.com submit a poll request and then go help make search terms on DuckDuckGo more relevant because the answers you submit will show up in the DuckDuckGo search results. So check out how cool is this, Alan? So you know I'm going to Columbus, Ohio, right? If yep. I go, if there's a command in DuckDuckGo where you just type bars, space the location. So I did bars, Columbus, Ohio, and I got a bunch of great bars in Columbus, Ohio with their Yelp ratings all listed out for me right here on DuckDuckGo. Nice. That's an example of a DuckDuckHack instant answer. Uh, here's another one that's kind of neat. QR, the command QR into DuckDuckGo search, and then a URL. So I just generated a QR code for techsnap.reddit.com. I could make another one right here. I could just type in any domain, like jupiterbroadcasting.com. You might have heard of that one before. Yep. And you pipe that in there, and boom, DuckDuckGo automatically generates a QR code. Again, an instant answer, or alternative to. You guys are probably familiar with the alternative to's website. I did alternative to, one word, Viber. And then DuckDuckGo shows me all of the best-rated alternatives to Viber. You can put any command in there, any, any program. It's pretty neat stuff. So DuckDuckGo is getting even better with your help. Go over to DuckDuckHack.com. Submit a poll request. Submit an instant answer about a topic you're passionate about because it's a great way to spread the word and spread information for other folks who are looking for more info. You know, it could be anything. Speaking of looking for more info, if you weren't looking for a bar but were looking for, say, something else... Is there a cool duck duck hack to show up? Like uh, maybe uh, give me an example of what you're looking for. 
like uh, uh, Alan like, JB or something. Oh, it? that one. Oh, that was that was that your hint to me there, Alan. Was yeah, that your? <laughs> and you were like completely oblivious. <laughs> I was thinking about Ohio. So, this is a cool right, one too. Watch. Like, uh, we should mention that we didn't mention. Yes, it last I know. Week, I know. Watch. Banks on DuckDuckGo.com. Bang mm-hmm. JB. Right, that'll search the Jupiter Broadcasting website. That tells DuckDuckGo. It's a DuckDuckGo command to search Jupiter Broadcasting, and then you can put any command. So, like, say I'll put uh, anything like I want to search the whole Jupiter Broadcasting website for Cisco, because Alan just mentioned Cisco at the end of the last segment. I hit search. It'll take you to the Jupiter Broadcasting websites with all of the episodes that have mentions of Cisco in them. How freaking cool is that? Just it's bang so exclamation mark JB on DuckDuckGo. And then what you're searching the website for. All kinds of neat things. Go to duckduckhack.com, submit your poll request. I'm sure it filters very nicely if you put like bang, JB, tech snap, and then some stuff. Give it a try. And it's like, where's the tech snap about where we talked about this one? Oftentimes when I'm writing the notes, it's like, ah, I remember we talked about yeah. this like a year ago. Right. I don't remember which episode. I want to include a link for people. But I, and then, you know, it's like, oh, well, there's like four episodes where we talked about that string of keywords. DuckDuckHack.com. Go submit a poll request. And remember, it's an open source platform, so you can help bring more open source. And because it's DuckDuckGo, the search engine that doesn't track you, you're also helping add more privacy to searching the web and helping keep it a competitive marketplace. DuckDuckHack.com. I know you guys have got some great answers. Uh, and and uh, really glad to hear that uh, some of you have checked it out and really liked it. They were really mm-hmm. pleased, which is great. I think uh, I think our audience in particular, there's probably a lot of sysadmins out there that are using DuckDuckGo and so there could, could be even better for, for them. Uh, so just a quick follow-up. Uh, Guy Thundar writes in and mentioned something that we saw during uh, last week's uh, show in the, t- in the chat room, too, but didn't call it out. Uh, he says, uh, I heard you guys mention it a couple of times that Steam embeds Internet Explorer, but actually it leverages the Chromium project. Uh, I'm sure at one point it did use IE, but this does not appear to be the case anymore. Thanks for the great show. Yeah, maybe when they switched over to Linux and Mac OS, they started embedding Chromium or something like that. Right, I guess they would have had to come up with a solution when they went to Mac because IE wasn't over there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, uh, so maybe Steam is a bad example, but there are lots of applications well, that Well, I know Stowe does, browser. like the Star Trek online yeah. patcher, for example, does. Does it still? I know it used to. I'm, the reason why I'm, I'm sure pretty sure it does is because in order to run it under Linux, I have to install uh, Internet Explorer for that. Right, but have you run it under Linux yeah. since it got bought? Oh, yeah, yeah, just okay. uh, over the weekend. Well, because I think I noticed the difference in Steam... Because now when you go to do stuff, it doesn't make that IE schnick click, sound. Click, 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 click. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that is so annoying. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it definitely seems to work better now that it's Chromium. But uh, thank you uh, for the heads up. Uh, so this one comes in, and the, the subreddit is already on top of it, but uh, EcoGDev, EcoDev, EcoDev, and I don't know. He says, I want a media server and player to be able to move my DVD collection into digital format and allow my wife to watch her favorite TV shows whenever she wants instead of the cable networks when they think she should watch it. Ideally, I'd like to buy a free NAS Mini for my existence for storage and a Roku for a simple interface to the data. My problem. I've only got 100 bucks to spend on this project. Current resources are a Linux tower with 8 gigs of RAM and a 2.8 gigahertz Intel processor, 4 SATA ports, an old Vista tower with an Intel Core 2 quad processor and 2 gigs of RAM, a 2013 MacBook currently hooked up to the TV for watching Netflix, and 8 gigabyte, uh, eight, 8 hard drives ranging from 125 gigs to 500 gigs. So he wants to know what maybe his best NAS setup could be, if there are ways to get more SATA ports uh, and, uh, and run power to the disk, and what hardware would give him the most bang for the buck? I wasn't sure how much we could answer some of this, but he has a few key questions oh, I thought okay. we could tune in on. Uh, yeah, um, more SATA ports. You can buy little PCI or PCI Express um, SATA interface cards. Uh, I've got a really cheap one off eBay for like $12 once. Uh, it was just like a little two-port one that just let me connect two more drives, which is all I really needed to do. Um, Especially if you're building a NAS, look for ones that are just regular HBA, just connects the drives, doesn't try to raid them. Uh, sometimes ones that do raid will let you just not do raid, but it's you'll probably save a lot of money and just have less trouble and less need for drivers and so on if you can just get a standard one that would just interface the drives and give you more SATA ports. Um, as far as laying out the drives with a bunch of drives of different sizes, uh, I would recommend, especially since he's got all these small drives, uh, in order to maintain the flexibility you want to be able to replace those drives with bigger ones as you can afford it, I would do uh, mirrors of two or three drives at a time um, of the drives that are kind of group them together into similar sizes, right? So if you have some 120 gig drives and some 500 gig drives, put the 500s together, put the 250s together, put Mm -hmm. the 120s together, Mm -hmm. and then 
as you can afford it, later on, you can say, I'm going to replace these two 120s because mm-hmm. they're going to die because they're really Super old if they're that small uh, with a pair of two terabyte drives. And because it's a mirror, once you replace all the drives in the mirror, or even the smallest drive in the mirror, the mirror grows to the size of the smallest drive. Uh, so if you actually have a mirror that consists of a 120 gig drive and a 500 gig drive, then you replace the 120 drive with a one terabyte drive. That mirror goes from being two uh, from being 120 gigs to being 500 gigs, and then when you replace the 500 with a two terabyte, it goes to one terabyte. Right? It keeps resizing to the size of the smallest disk in the set. That makes sense. I uh, I too I um, look at uh, I I kind of with the chat room, and I, I look at he's got a 2013 MacBook. Just essentially playing Netflix, and I think to myself, well, I think it, it sounds more like he's got a the the connector for the TV sitting there, and when he wants to watch Netflix, maybe. he hooks the Mac up to the thing and, and uses I, it for other I stuff. I kind of agree that. with the chat room. I would sell that MacBook, then I would buy a Roku and an external eSATA drive array. I'd put all those drives in the external eSATA chassis, then hook them up to the Linux tower. And there you go. Install Plex okay. media server on the Linux tower. But I, I'm, I imagine he's using that MacBook for some other stuff rather than just for watching Netflix. But if he is, then that's an easy solution there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, he asks about enough RAM for ZFS. Yeah, 8 gigs is more than enough. Um, it runs better with more, but you're not going to be needing that much performance out of it because you're just streaming video files off of it, which is nice linear reads. It'll be fine. I right. ran mine with two, only 2 or 4 gigs of, of RAM with like three or, or with uh, six 1.5 terabyte drives and that wasn't a problem i agree and i think either one of those machines is fast enough the vista rig or the linux box or yeah. even the 2013 mac now the vista rig only has two gigs of ram that's, that's probably pushing yeah that's weak if you're going to do something with that wipe it and make it headless mm-hmm. but by the sounds of it, you know this linux tower one of these machines is likely his desktop and he actually still needs it to use as a machine uh and so that raises some questions um, but yeah, one way obviously is have one of the machines be the file server. Uh, I'd hate to take away your Linux tower if that's your best machine. I don't know the, all the details yet, but if you get any machine running free NAS, uh, as your file server, you'll be able to play the files back via the MacBook, like you're doing for Netflix, yeah, right? You just totally. browse over the network yeah. and do that. You can install uh, the, uh, the Plex plugin. Exactly. Easy peasy. And uh, you can do it that way. All right, Jeremy writes in with our next email. But yeah, $100 isn't quite uh, going to cut it. Like, you no, can't. if you sell something, you might be able to. You'd be, you, you'd be very lucky to get a one three terabyte drive for your $100. Yeah. Uh, so Jeremy writes, hello, JB. Uh, I'm thinking of, I'm, t- I'm thinking a talk about patch system management might be in order. After all, with all these bugs and security notices going out there, I need to patch, 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 patch. Oh, and patch. So it might be, uh, it's becoming very time-consuming to manage dozens, hundreds, or more systems, bare metal or virtualized. Plus, let's face it, even three or four systems or clouds can be annoying to update. I know there is a show on Puppet, uh, Master Linux with Puppet, last uh, 2603, where Alan talked about that system. Still, there are six major solutions I have found. Puppet, Chef, or Ch- Chef, right? Not, not Chief, Chef, Chef yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's no I. Ansible and Salt, plus two big ones for Red Hat and Linuxes, which are Spacewalk and Red Hat Satellite. I will say that Ansible and Salt seem to approach uh, the situation. There's situ- also CF Engine uh, and a couple others. But yes, Ansible, Salt, and Puppet are the ones I've heard the most about. He says later. that Ansible and Salt seem to uh, approach the situation with a system admin mindset, whereas Puppet and Chef are more DevOps deployment mindset focused. Do you agree with that? Um, Maybe a bit. Uh, Ansible does everything over SSH. Uh, Salt, I think, is similar to Puppet, but just done in Python instead of Ruby. Um, I use Puppet because it's the one I started with, and I don't feel like migrating. <laughs> right, for sure. Uh, so we uh, include even, even some comparisons. Uh, salt and Ansible, I hear, are better. So he says, I have some other show ideas, but I'll post them separately. Uh, he'd like to know, though, uh, what your thoughts are on central management. And I know you're a longtime Puppet user. Have you have you glanced at Ansible? You don't mention it a lot. Have you looked at it? I haven't. I know a bunch of people that have and like it. Yeah. I just... Uh, from the brief ways I looked at it, it looked like it couldn't quite do as some of the complicated stuff I'm doing with mm-hmm. Puppet. Okay. Uh, because I'm not just configuring a machine with a certain profile. I'm teaching the machines about each other, like pre chaining their SSH keys and stuff. And also, I have some ridiculous hacks that are 
violate puppet rules even probably uh, where I'm actually generating DNS zone files and stuff based on information that each puppet adds to my puppet master database. Right. So each machine teaches my DNS server about all of its resources. Uh, using a crazy series of for loops and stuff, it's, it's, it's nasty, but it works. Salt and Puppet are the ones I hear a lot about. I, yes, I, uh, I hear a lot about Ansible. Yes, uh, that one too, yeah. Mostly just I know a bunch of people that use it, like Dan uh, Langill and uh, The thing that Michael gives Lucas me pause well. is I've heard of people switching from Puppet and Chef to Ansible the most. That seems to be the yep. people seem to be switching to Ansible. Um, yeah, and I've heard great things, but uh, I haven't looked at it enough to know. But when I did a very, very cursory look, it looked like it might not be able to do some of the more complicated stuff. Okay. It seemed to be easier to write, and that seemed to me that it might not be as expressive. Hmm. Uh, mostly it was just the time it would take me to learn something new versus Puppet is working now. Although Puppet is annoying because it likes to throw everything out and start over all over the time. Like, uh, they're like, oh, you know how you could have a config file and include other config files? Uh, we're getting rid of that functionality. You either have to put everything in one big config file or put them in separate files in this directory, and we will just include them all in alphabetical order and screw hierarchy. Uh, it's Kel- like, well, that screws me up a little bit. Keller CW78 in the chat room points out that Linux Academy, if you're a Linux Academy member who's a sponsor of... Uh, uh, Coda Radio and Linux Unplugged, they have a chef series to teach a chef. So that might be a way to dip your toes yeah. in and see if you like it. That could be a good way Because if I'm not mistaken, Puppet is just a Ruby port of Chef or CF Engine or one of the other existing ones that has then diverged quite a bit since then, but originally started that way. All right, Alan, next email is kind of along the same lines. Alex from Greece writes in. So I'd like to pose a question. I'm thinking of a way to centrally manage firewall of remote sites based on IP tables. More specifically, imagine lots of remote VPN clients, maybe even a thousand, connecting to a central hub server through OpenVPN. The administrator of the hub will have a web interface from where he'll be able to tweak some firewall rules, which will be pushed to all remote sites or to a specific site. Options that have popped into my head are, number one, create a web interface on a hub server where changes can be committed and set up a sync mechanism that will push firewall changes to remote sites through the VPN and then apply them. Number two, consider implementing a firewall module of Puppet. Is this feasible based on your experience? Any other ideas from your side? If it does matter, all systems will be Debian-based. Appreciate your dedication and quality since episode one. Keep up the good work, Alex from Greece. What do you think, yeah, Alan? Uh, using Puppet for a firewall configs is definitely a thing. Uh, and, yeah, it, it can make sense. Uh, a lot of enterprise... This is something that mo- a lot of enterprise firewalls have as a central management system or whatever. Uh, there's quite a few different ways to do it. Yeah, you know, you can have... I put the firewall rules in Git, but then it's like, how do you manage having different rules for different machines? And that's where the puppet stuff comes in and uh, so on. Um, what do you think about the central web interface with the VPNs and sounding a little hairy to me? Well, if he's talking about creating that, it's like, sure, that's great, but that's going to take a while. Well, and talk about like one point to compromise. If all your servers are connecting, if all of your firewalls are VPNing back to one central point, uh, it makes yep. me a little nervous. Kind of. Uh, and that's, you know, where Puppet can kind of come in because the agents call out to the Puppet Master and they authenticate using a certificate. Yeah. Against the, and so they have to be signed and well, it's all and encrypted. He, and when he's helps. talking about the number of boxes, too, I think Puppet sounds like a much more scalable solution, but also one that you could transfer off to somebody. Like, step away from it and be like, all right, you manage this now. And Puppet, like, is going to be a much more easier thing to hand off, I think, than some custom built yeah. open VPN script sync solution. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, because at first I wasn't sure if he was talking about pushing firewall rules to the clients when they connect to the VPN, which is a completely different thing. Mm-hmm. No, VPN, I think he's talking but, about pushing firewall yeah. rules to, yeah, firewalls. Yeah. That, um, it'd be interesting to get a little more detail on how his network is laid out. Yeah. Like, I think he's talking about 1,000 VPN clients. Of a, do they all connect back to the central server, or does each client connect to the server closest to them and use that, and then that's on a network that connects back to the central kind of thing. Yeah, lots of VPN uh, remote clients connecting on a central hub server through OpenVPN. Right. See, you might get a lot better experience by having VPN users connect to the VPN node that's closest to where they are at the time Yeah. and then using having a private network between yeah. your VPN nodes. Yeah. I know that's how uh, the VPN I use at a couple of my ISPs that for the server provider for Scale Engine where we have to VPN in to get access to the management systems. Uh, to like do out of band management on our servers, 
is, you know, it does geolocation, figure out where I am and routes, you know, even though I want to connect to the management port on my server in Singapore, I VPN to their node in Chicago, and then it goes over the private network all the way to Singapore. Nice. Instead of me connecting to Singapore. Mm -hmm. Much better, much better performance. Yes, because, uh, you know, especially if, if I was just a regular person in Canada having a home ISP, I doubt my ISP has very good routes to Singapore where they have great routes to Chicago, and then the company who owns right. the servers in Chicago and Singapore has a nice private network going between them, and I'll get a better connection and lower latency. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next email comes in from The Beard Farmer. Just to pass on along a little wisdom, he says, Chris and Alan, there have been a number of comments of late of people providing their experiences on finding flaws in public Wi-Fi and testing of exploits to see if the device is vulnerable, and then asking you about how to approach the owner to make the problem known. I would submit... That if you weren't asked to look at the problem, then why are you doing it? By testing without authorization, you are no better than those who would take to the next step towards exploiting the vulnerability. If you were in my neighborhood walking down the street, rattling doorknobs, and going up to tell people that their door is unlocked, many would scream foul. It's, is, is that really ethical? While it's true that locks only keep honest people honest, unless you were invited, then you shouldn't be mucking with the stuff that isn't yours. While this behavior in everyday life that would be considered improper, like invading people's privacy, frowned upon when it's done under the veil of security. It's somehow considered okay, though. I haven't done a lot of penetration testing over my 30 years in IT industry. And uh, I have done, I'm sorry, I have done a lot of penetration testing over my 30 years in the IT industry and have always been invited to point out flaws. I never try to locate them on my own. If you have a legitimate concern if something is secure or not, approach them first, get permission, and be invited to take a look. I see his point there. And I agree. I guess the difference is most of the times the ones we're talking about are more obvious than that. So if you're walking down the street and you see that the front door is wide open and the guy's in his garage working, you might be like, hey, you left your door open. Right? Which is different than going up and rattling the doorknob to see if it was locked. Mm -hmm. right? If the door is wide open <laughs> and the guy's in the garage making a bunch of noise and not noticing that somebody's walking away with his TV, you might say, hey, you might want to take a look at that. And I think maybe the one that Beard Farmer got the most recent that kind of got him railed up was that one where the Linksys router or whatever it was, was like all default logins. and all, So it was almost like right. the door is open and the keys are right here and you can just take the keys and leave. Yeah. I, but I also agree. I think in general... All right, if you're walking down you the should street and see your neighbor left the keys in the lock in the door, you might take them out and put it under the but welcome mat or it something. It really, like, when you think the Wi-Fi router isn't secure, just be like, hey, I think maybe, do you want me to take a look? And if they say no, then you take the proper precautions right. to protect yourself and leave it at that. So I kind of agree with Beard yeah. Farmer. Just use a VPN on public Wi-Fi and let it be somebody else's problem. Yeah. All right, our last, and we got, by the way, lots of emails, so there's some we didn't get to. I will try to get to them next week for sure. Uh, Peter wrote in, though, with a ZFS question. I felt like we couldn't wrap up without a good, solid ZFS question. He says, hello, Chris and Alan. I have an HP microserver running Ubuntu with ZFS Linux. Uh, I guess it's a real thing, ZFS, Z-E-T-F-S Linux. I have four one-gigabyte mix, what? I have four one-gigabyte mixed make drives. One gigabyte? He must mean one terabyte yes. uh, in there, but all in good condition. I went for the RAID Z option, and I kept photos, uh, apps, and media on there. I stream all my media using Plex, which is pretty stable, but I noticed that on Windows 7 or 8, when I browse the photos, all of a sudden, the mount becomes unresponsive between 30 and 90 seconds. The folder freezes up, and I cannot open a new one. It doesn't time out, and eventually it comes back. It happens quite often when I'm trying to find some good shots for something. It may even happen, happen while copying. It will just stick there. I suspect Samba is the culprit, but I cannot really find what to tweak. I appreciate Samba is not fully compatible with ZFS, but I wish Windows would support NFS or another way around. One episode, you mentioned mounting Windows via iSCSI, but maybe I misunderstood. Do you know anything that could remedy this? It doesn't seem to happen on any devices using NFS. Thanks for the great show. Well, so there's a couple of questions. If he's saying the problem is Samba, possibly, uh, I I use Samba here at home off my FreeBSD server, and I basically mount almost everything. I'm like most of the applications I have on my computer are actually installed to the network drive over Samba, uh, because this machine only has a, a small SSD as for the OS. They're mirrored, but I. Basically, don't I try to keep almost everything on the network drive so I have the space on the SSD to record uh, BSD now, and so and I don't have any trouble with 
And sometimes there's like a slightly more latency because you're going over the network and back, especially I when have, you're generating uh, the list of a... If you have like a thousand files in a directory, it yes. might take an extra second to load, I but have seen not this, 30 seconds. I've seen this on uh, on Linux Samba servers where I had clients that had directories that would have very large TIFF files, and there was like literally like ten to 30,000 TIFF files. Ah, and it might be Windows generating the thumbnails. I, that's what it is. you need to go into the Windows settings and turn off generate thumbnails. Yeah, that'll help. And that, it, that's something that I forget that I always turn off immediately yeah. on Windows. And uh, it seems to be, and I don't know exactly why, because this, this the problem... Although in this, I thought Windows is smart enough not to do that on network drives. Yeah. See, this is the thing, is Windows isn't... Yeah, so this is... And in this case, for my, for my client, the application they were using was actually the culprit. So the application ah. would go to the network drive, use Explorer, and it, would, it was the problem. And I, I think it came down to like tons of connections, or I do not recall the specifics because it's been a couple of years, but I have ran into this. There is uh, Unix services for Windows. I don't know how current that is. And um, yeah, I wouldn't do that. And there is the iSCSI method. Now, so iSCSI is different. When you iSCSI mounts a block device. Right. So if you used iSCSI, you wouldn't get your shared files. You'd have to make a, a ZVOL right. on ZFS. It would look like a... And then and then it would show up as a disk in yes. Windows, and then you would format it with NTFS yeah. and store files on it. Which sounds crazy, I opted, but yeah. Uh, I opted away from using that just because I would have to make that volume a certain size and use it. And then that, all that space would be blocked off on my ZFS server instead of just being regular files in ZFS. And, you know, I kind of like the fact that I can access the files that I store on my uh, ZFS server from over the network from other machines and stuff. Even yeah. if they're not Windows. Yeah, absolutely. That's key for me. And yeah. uh, that's why keeping them on a Samba share or an NFS mount is critical. I think but you yeah, can... I don't know. Yeah, so I look at you know in the, Windows uh, and generate thumbnails and stuff. In the, uh, in the uh, smb.conf, you can go down to the specific share, and there are options you can stick in there that uh, help alleviate this problem. Yeah, uh, and, and there are a bunch of settings. I would wonder which version of ZFS on Linux he's using, make sure that's current, mm. and what version of uh, Samba. Because I know there were some problems with early versions of four, but I wonder if he is using three or, or the other thing too four. to play with is you could, if it's over your LAN, mess around with some of your NT setting, NTLM settings, and see if those make a difference, and see if it speeds things up. See if you like that. I don't know. I'll leave that to you. But uh, I have, I, I feel bad for you because this was one of those problems I hunted for a while because it was happening to a whole group of end users and the server was all good resources wise. Plenty of processor, plenty of network and disk I.O. available. But when the Windows Explorer would open up the disk, Windows Explorer would just hang for about 30 seconds. And when you when an application hangs on a user's computer for 30 seconds, it feels like 30 hours. It was awful. And I, I remember I was continually like checking SMB status. Play around with the SMB status command and you can tweak with stuff and, and see if you notice what Windows Explorer is doing by watching SMB status and maybe that'll get yep. you going the right path. Okay. Well, we still oh, have... There's uh, one other thing I wanted to mention. Uh, when I was actually... Uh, in the lobby of a hotel the other uh, last week or earlier this week actually, uh, to uh, taking my girlfriend's mom back to the airport, uh, the flight crew from the previous flight was coming in and checking into the hotel, and one of them recognized me from TechSnap oh, and awesome. said that he was a big fan of the show. Do you remember his name? Just give him a shout out if you I, do. I did until a minute. ago. I know until I said something. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I did that same thing, but you remember it happened. Yeah, sorry, I don't remember your name now. I think it was Rob or something. I forget. Well, Rob, but, uh, maybe thank Rob. Thank you uh, for nice to meet you. taking you the for time watching. to uh, introduce yourself yeah. and say that you like the show. Yeah, absolutely. Nice to meet and you, maybe, Rob. Because it was interesting. He's like, you know, obviously I'm a in the airline industry, not in IT, but I still enjoy the show, and I'm Good. glad to see that people do. That's awesome. We might maybe he listens to us while he's flying. He just puts in one ear bed. I'm sure he keeps one ear available to listen to this to the cockpit situation. But we've got one ear dedicated to text now. That's what I like to think. Yeah, well, just you know, accidentally pipe it through the PA system one time. Right. And get the whole flight. Uh, in. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will be now listening to TechSnap. It is your weekly systems network and administration podcast. Uh, please enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, send us yeah, your emails. So I wonder which airline is. I wonder if it's WestJet. We can get them to include the right? ca back catalog of why not? Snap, not in the uh, on-screen uh, TVs. Yeah, entertainment display. Why not? I think that'd be cool. Uh, TechSnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com. That's the email. Click the contact link at the top of the Jupiter Broadcasting website or techsnap.reddit.com. An even better place to go to submit your feedback. It's a big part of our show, so please send in your questions, and we'll answer them on the next episode of TechSnap. But, Alan, with the email all done, I do believe that means it's time for the text up roundup.
it's time for the TechSnap Roundup. Yeah, that's what that crazy music means. Now, the Roundup are stories that just didn't quite fit at the top of the show, but we still want to talk about them, give you some links to follow up on your own. And many of these links came from our incredible subreddit over at techsnap.reddit.com. And Alan, our first Roundup story is about a supercomputer. Well, yeah, a 55,000 like- core supercomputer at least. Yeah, some, we look at the hardware from iX and, you know, the mega core and the mega ports and all that, and we're like, oh, hardware envy, and then it's like 55,000 yeah, cores. Yeah, 55,000. That's a different category. They uh, custom-built, obviously, as you'd expect, software. Uh, they call it the Hyperion, which is a custom light rendering machine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, it even sends out uh, alerts to iPhones when uh, certain scenes have successfully rendered, and they can send out versions of it to a 3D printer to see what it looks like in real life, what it will be rendering. Cool. <laughs> that is really cool, actually. Uh, all right, uh, next story in the roundup. Cisco is patching a three-year-old Telnet remote code execution vulnerability in its appliances. Yeah. So this is... Uh, so. Back in 2011, FreeBSD released a security advisory saying, hey, I know nobody still uses it, but we found a flaw in the Telnet daemon where if you do certain things this way, uh, it'll overflow buffer and remote code execution, and that's really, really bad. Don't so want that. So it's really important that you patch if you're still using Telnet. Totally. Uh, and also, why are you still using Telnet? Don't use Telnet. Yeah. Um, that was three years and ago? So, yeah, it was uh, December 2011. Okay. So almost four years ago. Sure, I'm sure everybody um, patched then. No problem. Problem solved. Right. And so Metasploit's had a, a module for this for a long time. And, and But turns out that Cisco forgot to patch the web security appliance, the email security appliance, and the content security management appliance. Oh, that is a lot of appliances. So a bunch of their appliances that are based on FreeBSD, and they kind of forgot to install that and possibly other patches. <laughs> wah, wah. Yeah. And uh, a lot of them have Telnet for the management stuff. And, uh, yeah, bad times. All right. Well, good news for uh, Google users who maybe want to up their security a little bit. Google has updated their two-factor authentication system to support the FIDO standard. You know, the FIDO Alliance is that uh, organization founded in 2012. It's a company such as Google, Microsoft, Samsung, Arm, and Qualcomm of others. I have YubiKeys in there, and you can, you can use these FIDO-compatible second authenticator tokens now as a second auth method for Googs. So like That's YubiKey and stuff, you can uh, use definitely uh, a universal one is definitely interesting. Totally. Uh, I, I wonder about some of the security. I'd like to have, I'd like to learn more about it and then ask intelligent questions about it to uh, Doug Erling's program, who we interviewed on BSD Now back when I was in the UK, so September-ish, um, because he talked about the two-factor authentication system that he designed. Uh, now, he did it one-off for the uh, University of Oslo, but... Yes, I do wonder about something kind of universal so that I don't need 20 different authenticators would be nice. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right, next story in the roundup. Not as cool as uh, dual. What's that? The next story is irony. Yeah, <laughs> Spam Nation, uh, Brian Krebs' new book. Yes, so Brian Krebs wrote a new book, uh-huh. and then uh, that comes out November 18th. Which so I have pre-ordered. Three, four weeks away. I already have it ordered. Yeah. Um, turns out the publisher just disclosed that their credit card system has been breached and their online shopping cart totally. I'm sorry. Unbuzzled. What? I'm sorry. You're saying the book that not, I not uh, most people pre-ordered from Amazon or Barnes and Noble or Politics and Pros or somewhere, right? Where'd you buy yours from? I got it from Amazon. Right. So you're fine. It's only the people that bought it directly from the publisher. I might have bought it from his website. I might have bought it directly from his website. I think he, he recommended people go to Amazon okay. and so on. Okay. He didn't ever recommend okay. the publisher one, so should be okay. That is pretty ironic, uh, though. Yes. Um, the interesting thing is that um, how bad it was as well. So the publisher is kind of small. doesn't do that much. Like in total, between the April 16th and June 19th when it happened, so why are we only finding about it now if it happened on June 19th? Um, only like 5,000 people were affected. And that's, I think, everyone that was in the database before and during the breach. So it's not a very popular site. But they said that uh, they got gain access to customers' credit card information, including the card number, expiration date, the cardholder name, and the card verification number, the CVV, uh, which I'll get to in a second, but that's not supposed to be stored in databases. Mm-hmm. That was the whole point of the CVV. Mm-hmm. Um, the billing account information, including first name, last name, email and address, phone number, and address. In some cases, the shipping information, first name, last name, phone number, and address. In some cases, your account password, which I'm 
guessing because it was a small one-off thing, might not have been properly hashed. And uh, they say, to their knowledge, data access did not include track data, pin number, or printed card verification data. Whatever that means. Right. Kind of uh, embarrassing for Brian Krebs. Yeah. yeah, and that's why he's getting out in front of it, because uh, the company is called Sourcebooks, and uh, yeah, they had a bit of trouble with that. Uh, and just a reminder, if you pre-ordered soon enough, you can get the special Krebs edition, uh, Krebs on security, uh, Zeus guard. Right. Um, little security, Oops, USB security stick. device thing. Well, Alan, did you hear about those crazy cats in Hungary? They uh, plan to impose a new tax on internet data transfers. So if, you get, if you're going to be transferring data over your internet tubes, you're going to get taxed. A draft 2015 tax bill submitted to Parliament late on Tuesday showed a move that could hit internet and telecom providers and their customers quite hard. It's a draft tax code that contains provisions for internet providers to pay a tax of uh, about 30, uh, 150, what is that, Alan? What, four nits? Per gigabyte of data. So there's a fee per gigabyte of data transferred. Yeah, but the fee is ridiculously high. Yeah, 37 pence per gigabyte of data transferred. Yeah, so that's 37 UK cents. So that's about 60 cents US. Yeah. Per gigabyte. Yeah. That's... But yeah, Alan, it Alan, it's a it's a tax to offset companies' corporate income tax problems. Right. That are, if it having. was thirty, if it was sixty cents a terabyte, maybe. <laughs> Within hours of the tax provision, over a hundred thousand people joined a Facebook group protesting the levy, saying that thousands would rally against the tax, which they said is excessive. Yeah, this is crazy. Yeah, so in particular, it says fixed line internet traffic in Hungary. So that doesn't count anything mobile. Uh, was 1.15 billion gigabytes in 2013, and mobile internet added another 18 million gigabytes. So uh, that would be 175 billion dollars. Where are they going to? Where, where are people going to get 175 billion dollars to, to pay in taxes? Tax money is magic money, Alan. It just comes from the from the sky. Yeah, but the, from the cloud, the tax, quite literally. <laughs> the, the tax rate is a little too high in yeah, this particular case. At all. If you want to tax on. Internet data, sure, but it needs to be, you know, a couple of cents. And and every like 200 gigabytes or something. I mean, come on. Yeah. I don't get taxing bits. It's, they're not a precious yeah. resource. And, and yeah, the, it, it just doesn't make sense because the volume of what you consume doesn't really proportionally link to anything, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's like, you know... It's silly. Hey, Alan, you know what I hate? Namespace file corruption bugs, especially when it's MongoDB on certain Linux systems. Yeah, so this one's uh, MongoDB is a, a web scale database. Wow. Um, you just did scary quotes, but people didn't get to see that. That was great. Oh, they didn't get to see it? No, okay. go ahead. Do it again. Scary quotes. Uh, do, it, do it again. Yeah. Web scale. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you have to have seen the YouTube memes to understand what I'm talking about. Anyway, uh, when you're running MongoDB on Linux on top of VMware, uh, when MongoDB asks the Linux kernel to please zero out this whole file and then rewrites the namespace information, the Linux kernel would sometimes fail to zero out the data. So when MongoDB looked again at the file, it would see the old data that it asked to be erased and wow. think that was new data and would say, hey, your namespace file is corrupted. Have fun not accessing your data. Wow. Uh, so I think this is an optimization for the VMware where the Linux kernel was supposed to say, hey, VMware, erase this for me. Uh, so instead of the... Um, MongoDB having to manually go and write out zeros over the whole file, which could be quite large, uh, it would say, hey, just zero that for me. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to be all optimized. Mm -hmm. uh, and apparently there's a bug in there somewhere where that wasn't happening. Mongo uh, DB versions 2.65 and 2412 will contain workarounds for the bug. Yeah, so basically their workaround was manually zero out the file if they detect the conditions where it might not be getting, happening properly. So, hey, Alan, I see you throw this story in here about T-Mobile hardening part of its U.S. cellular network. Uh, and they're, they're upping up encryption, right? Uh, they're using... Yeah, so by default, 2G networks have always used A5 slash 1 for encryption. Right. Uh, and they're upgrading that to A5 slash 3. So that, the, both have been around for a long time. A5 slash 3 is not exactly secure, but it makes mass eavesdropping harder. You can intercept individual phones, but it's harder to listen to a bunch of phones. Yeah. And what's interesting now, is they've already rolled this out in Germany, right? Yes. Now, T-Mobile is owned by Deutsche Telekom from Germany. They rolled this out last year after the NS they found out about the NSA targeting Germans a lot. So they've already rolled this out in Germany, and they're just upgrading their network in the U.S. Uh, 
you know, I think it was the Washington Post and a couple other papers found that in a bunch of locations, it's already working that way. Yeah. Uh, AT&T said they've been doing this for a while, but when the Washington Post tested, none of the locations they tested ever were using newer encryption. I, what, I, what I find fascinating is they're not making a big marketing splash out of it. it. It seems like they're actually trying to do it a little bit under the radar so that maybe they don't get the uh, stink eye of some uh, law enforcement agencies like exactly. other folks have been. Uh, well, good for T-Mobile. GSM is still well, a huge, horrible mess, but good for T-Mobile. Yeah, but, you know, uh, yeah, all the A5s are bad, so it's not like upgrading to A5 slash 3. It's like it's not that big of an improvement, but every little bit helps, I mm-hmm, suppose. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But if it makes anybody feel more secure, uh, it's actually not doing its job because what really needs to happen is replace it with something better. The problem is if your phone's still using 2G, it's probably an old phone. Gosh. Uh, or they're getting AT&T's you to fall back to it for some that they're uh, planning to kill off the 2G network in 2018. There you go. I there think currently you. in the States, it only accounts for like, eight or nine percent of all calls right and some of that is just when you know the 3g network is at a range uh but we have heard about those worldwide and especially in uh emerging markets mm. and so on it accounts for like 60 percent of the calls well, and we also talked about those uh surveillance monitoring devices law enforcement has that bumps you yep. down to 2g so that way they can monitor so they can exactly yeah all right Alan. well adobe heard you like flaws in your flaws so they patched it so that way you have a flaw in your patch not quite. Uh, this <laughs> I was one trying. Is just, there was a, a, a Flash exploit uh, last week, and uh, they released a fix, but already the vulnerability is being used in two of the m- biggest exploit kits, and uh, oh, okay. sites that have been hacked all over the internet are serving up this malware. So anyone who hasn't updated their Flash player yet is uh, at risk of getting infected quite badly. Okay. Very good. There you go. Surprise, surprise, everybody. Surprise, surprise. You might have heard about this Tor router. We talked about it on Tech Talk today. We were a little skeptical. It turns out the Kickstarter guys were pretty skeptical, too. In fact, they froze the project. Uh, They were asking for $7,500 to fund a privacy-focused router project that would Tor all of the things. Uh, They got 82 times that amount. And now Kickstarter on Friday suspended the project. Pretty incredible. An email to the project investor, Kickstarter told, told backers a review of the project uncovered evidence that broke Kickstarter's rules. Those emails, or I'm sorry, those rules, the email continued, prohibit offering purchased items and claiming to have made them yourself. Ah. There yeah, you go. Yeah, and uh, the other thing, yeah, well, part of it was saying there was uh, custom hardware, this and that, instead of off-the-shelf hardware. Well, that makes it sound I'm like they could actually do it, the though. The price wouldn't have... The price that they were asking, the amount of money they were asking for wouldn't have made it possible to do custom hardware. Yeah. Yeah, uh, forty five bucks. I don't think what they were offering was really going to do any good. No, I know, I know. If you want, uh, you know, something like a Raspberry Pi that has two NICs would be able to do all this yeah. pretty easily. Okay, so uh, Samsung has delivered a fix for a very, very popular series of their SSD drives, the yes, uh, eight forty Evo. Evo. Yeah. Uh, now apparently, so uh, apparently, what happens is if you write data and then don't change the data, it will get slower and slower over time on the SSD which is kind of strange. Normally, it would be the data you were rewriting a lot that would cause the problem. Anyway, uh, so they've issued a firmware update that is supposed to fix the problem, although some people are suspicious of whether it actually fixes the problem or just masks it. Uh, In particular, they've included a data migration software tool uh, that apparently will just go through the drive, read the files that haven't been changed recently, (laughs) and rewrite them so that they have been changed recently so that their uh, algorithm for keeping the data, all the cells fresh or whatever, will will sync back up or something. Huh. So they they increase the amount of reads and writes to the drive, essentially, over the life of it to keep it performing better, though. Apparently. They're like, let's wear out the drive to keep it performing. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Sometimes, I'm not like, sure. sometimes you hear about this stuff and you go, oh, I should have bought The firmware Intel. is always a black box and it's always like, eh. Yeah, That's but why it, I was really interested in NANDFS for FreeBSD, which right. is I want to talk directly to the Flash chips and have a basically replace firmware with software that is open source mm-hmm. and can be patched and maintained yeah. over the long haul. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right. So did you hear about this snafu that the South Korean ID systems had? In fact, they're saying rebuild it from scratch. Alan, what's going on? Uh, so South Korea introduced a national ID system in the 60s. Uh, and because of a series of breaches, uh, it's been happening since 2004. Uh, more than 80% of the country has been exposed to possible identity. That's 80%? Right. Every, everybody's had their... Basically, they're equivalent to their social security number stolen. So it's now, just like a common thing. Used, yeah. 
Well, part of the problem is that the way they do the ID numbers over there is like the first six digits of your ID number are your birth date. And then it's a, a zero or a one based on if you're a man or a woman. And then there's some other numbers. Uh, and part of the problem they found is that they made the same mistakes the U.S. system does, right? Overuse. Like the fact that, mm. you know... Um, it gets used for everything. In the, even in the States, driver's license get used to prove your identity. Oh, yeah. But it's supposed to be proving that you're allowed to drive. That's not the same thing. Right. It's right? a state-issued ID, though, so they get they use yeah. it for all kinds of things. And, you know, your social insurance number gets used for your a tax sec- information. Or a security check when I call into my one of my accounts. Like Yeah. And, all, and so it, the more people that have it, the more chance it gets to be exposed. Basically, the problem is that there's no authentication. Currently, the authentication is knowing that number. And that's not very strong security, right? It's like you don't have a password. You have your ID number. It would be like if websites just needed a username to log in and no password. Right? Mm-hmm. It's, that's the, the unique identifier of you. And, and so that caused the problem. Uh, but the biggest, the other problem is you can't get a new number in Korea. But the way their system works, because it's based on your birthday, and it's oh unique. right. <laughs> and so if you do get your ID stolen, you can't get a different number. Oh my gosh, I didn't think. Well, I think that. even in the states, it's hard to get a different social. Uh, I've never. I didn't even, I didn't even. I don't even know if you can. I, I, I assume you could. But... Not. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, and because they're based on date and sex and all that, it's just a horrible mess. Also, uh, the government requires the use of Microsoft ActiveX. Uh, to provide a dig- digital signature if you want to sign government documents or interact with your bank. Mm. And so it's like, yeah, we have to replace the entire thing. Uh, and they're like, yeah, and uh, yeah, it'll cost like $20 billion or something. Wow. I'm like, hmm. Seems like somebody could come up with a better system for less than $20 billion. I think they should burn that system with fire, personally. Yeah. Well, it was invented in the 60s, but it'll be interesting to see if they come up with something that actually is going to work. Uh, and addresses some of the issues like, you know, reuse is the biggest one is that, you know, you should only, your national ID number should only be used with the government. You shouldn't be able to, you shouldn't have to give it to anyone else ever. Right. And there should be some other system for that. Right. And, you know, it should be tied to some other type of authentication, not just that. Agreed with you a hundred percent, Alan. Uh, all right. Is there anything else we want to cover in the TechSnap program today? Nope, that's the assignment. Oh, 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 oh. Well, there you go. That'll be the uh, sum of our show right there. All of it put together for you, episode 185 in the can. Once you go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com, click on episode 185. You'll find links to everything we talked about and also RSS feeds where you can subscribe and get the show every single week. Don't forget about that subreddit, techsnap.reddit.com. And last but not least, we definitely want your emails. Go over to Jupiter Broadcasting and click the contact link. Pro tip, choose TechSnap in the drop down. That'll do it. And then you send it in, and our uh, robots will make sure it gets delivered to our inbox. And last, but definitely not least, we'd love to have you join us live over jblive.tv on a Thursday at 1 p.m. Pacific, which is? 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UGC. Boom, there you go. You can also join us at jblive.info for the audio-only versions. And uh, then later on, we'll put the whole thing out. But if you want more show, if you want to see the in-between segment stuff, like when we get up and go to the bathroom... Well, then you just got to watch live because we're not going to put the potty break in the show. Not yet, at least. Unless we have to stretch things out a bit. That's when you know it's a bad sign. All right, everyone. (laughs) Thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of TechSnap. We'll see you right back here next week.